Good evening and welcome to the Carnegie Town Hall. This meeting of the Sioux Falls City Council will begin in a few moments. The City Council meets on the first, second, and third Tuesday of each month at 7 o'clock p.m. and serves as the City's policy-making and legislative body. Each meeting is governed by Robert's Rules of Order unless those guidelines conflict with City Ordinance or Charter. City Council meetings offer an opportunity for citizens to speak directly to their elected representatives. Those in attendance are invited to address the Council during the public input segment at the beginning of the agenda. At that time, any issue that is not subject to formal action later in the agenda can be addressed. Testimony that concerns a resolution or an ordinance's second reading is only allowed when those specific agenda items are being addressed by the Council. When addressing the Council, citizens should speak directly into the microphones at the podium and state their names for the record after being recognized by the Chair. To accommodate and respect all viewpoints, citizen comments are limited by ordinance to no more than five minutes each. Comments should be respectful and focused on providing new information that will benefit the Council's deliberative process. The Chair reserves the right to limit the number of speakers. City Council meetings are broadcast live on CityLink and online at www.siouxfalls.org. Information regarding the City Council, its committees, meetings, briefings, and members is available by visiting www.siouxfalls.org slash council or by calling the council office at 605-367-8085. Thank you for your interest in Sioux Falls City Government. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's City Council meeting. Thanks so much for being here tonight. Uh, we'll start our meeting uh, of July 14th, 2015, with a roll call of our City Council. Council members Jamison? Here. Karski? Here. Kylie? Here. Rolfing? Here. Staggers? Present. Anderson? Here. Erickson? Here. Erpenbach? Here. Thank you so much. Uh, in Sioux Falls, we start our council meetings with an invocation. We're blessed to have Reverend David Kramer of our souls unitarian universalist church here in sioux falls tonight uh, to lead us in that invocation what we'd ask is that you stand and then remain standing for our pledge of allegiance uh, reverend kramer welcome thank you thank you everyone what a glorious summer day i had a chance to run the bike bicycle trail around the city earlier today and i want to take this opportunity to just to thank the council and the city for providing that great great trail Today also is Bastille Day. In 1789, just 13 years after the colonies declared independence from Great Britain, the people of France stormed the Bastille, which was a fortress and prison that held political prisoners, and interestingly, perhaps, also gunpowder and ammunition, which may echo for us a little later in the meeting. Thus started the French Revolution. About a month later, they issued, the French issued their Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, along with Thomas Jefferson. This helped draft a new era of government in the world, across the nation, and, and across the globe. Along with our own Bill of Rights, our Declaration of Independence, and our preamble to the Constitution, we created a government of the people, by the people, and for the people in all of its idiosyncrasies and quirks and turns. Here are just a few of the articles from their bill. I want you to hear how similar that sounds to our own founding principles. The goal of any political association is the conservation of the natural and imprescriptible rights of liberty, property, safety, and the resistance against oppression. All citizens have the right of contributing personally or through their representatives to the formation of the law. It must be the same for all. Any person is presumed, presumed innocent until he is declared culpable. No one may be, disturbed, may, be, may be disturbed for his opinions, even religious ones, provided that their manifestation does not trouble the public order established by law. And the free communication of thoughts and of opinions is one of the most precious rights. Any citizen thus may speak, write, and print freely. Please join me in a spirit of prayer. 
Gracious God, we walk in the footsteps of giants, our forebears who forged a new form of government, a new nation, and a world based on liberty, rights, fairness for all. We inherit their legacy and are entrusted with it this month as we celebrate our national heritage and today the heritage of other nations with whom we share a bond. Let us be faithful stewards of this legacy. Our forebears were bold. May we be bold too. Our forebears looked forward. May we look forward too. Our forebears sought a better world for everyone, a world where our many differences were bridged by inalienable rights. So may we too live in a world where difference brings us many colors, but does not divide us. In the name of all that is holy, we pray. Amen. Amen. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you so much, Council. Let's now move to our consent agenda. Uh, any items you'd like to discuss? Move for approval, Anderson. Second, Erickson. Councilor Anderson Jr. has made a motion to approve our consent agenda, seconded by Councilor Erickson. Uh, any discussion items? A roll call vote, please. Council members Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0. Thank you. Then our regular agenda for tonight, uh, Council, any uh, motions, changes? Move to approve. Second. Kylie. Councilor Jamison has made a motion to approve our agenda, seconded by Councilor Karski. Uh, if no discussion, a roll call vote, please. Council member Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Thank you. That has also passed 8 to 0. Folks, welcome to our meeting tonight. This is an opportunity for you to engage the council really on any topic that is of, of interest to you. Um, now, if there's an item that's on the agenda later on, we would ask that you hold your comments until that time. Uh, but if there's another topic, uh, please just come forward. Two things we ask. <laughs> Just state your name, please, uh, to the people of our town. And if you could just keep your comments to five minutes or less, we'd appreciate that. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Scott Erisman, Sioux Falls. I wanted to quote uh, my favorite founding father, Benjamin Franklin, because Robert Colby seems to like to do that. He said, uh, beer is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. Um, anyway, moving on from there, uh, uh, I think we really need to fix Sire. And I hope it's done before we get into the budget hearings so that I, we can watch them. They're very long. I think anybody has to sit here in the audience and watch them, comforts of their home. So I hope we get that fixed. Um, even if it's considered an informational thing and not uh, um, public record, uh, uh, we are paying for it. So we should have that service to us. I watched an interesting um, exchange today about the 85, 85th Street Exchange uh, with I-29. Um, I think it's kind of disheartening that the city doesn't want to annex this land and get, a, get in with this thing right away. You gotta realize something to the, to the layman here. If we're not a part, if the city of Sioux Falls is not a part of this development, that means they're not a part of any municipality. That means there's two pennies that won't be taxed out there. It'll only be four pennies. Now you gotta kind of imagine this. If a big box store is out there and they're selling a television for $3,000 and a, and a big box store in Sioux Falls is selling a uh, television for $3,000, they will be able to get the television for $60 less if they go out to the 85th exchange. I don't understand why we would be passing up millions of dollars in sales tax revenue. Um, another thing that amazes me about that is just last year, this city went to the state legislature and begged for a third penny. But we're not using our brain here and going, the, the, the immense sales tax revenue that we could get? And what is stopping T or Harrisburg to moving in and annexing this? I don't know. Um, I think um, we really need to consider and, and work with the group. Um, 
The other thing that I do have a concern about it, though, Dakota Dunes was an example of another CID that was used. Dakota Dunes was one of these things that was set up so a lot of rich people could build their houses on a river, a river that floods every year, and so they could hide from paying a lot of taxes. But boy, when their houses all flooded, they sure wanted the government's help. And we all came down, they were at the National Guard, and we helped them all out. So that does concern me a little bit that we would leave this as a CID and leave this just sitting out in the open. What I think this really is, and I've been hearing about this exchange for months, didn't know a lot about it. I think this is a, a battle between a bunch of developers and a bunch of people that are very well connected in this community. And that's all it really is, is a fight. Now, all I'm asking is that the city comes forward and gives their best effort and helps them and gets involved and tries to annex <coughs> this as soon as possible. The other thing I found amazing about their presentation <laughs> was that uh, they actually went to D.C. and they got things done with the federal government. We always sit here and talk about how we can't get things done with the federal government. Well, that's not true. You can get things done with the federal government. That's a great example there. I want to talk about Minnehaha County funding. They just had an opt out. My property taxes get to go up again. Um, because there's a discrepancy in the way we fund our governments. In the long term, I think that all property tax revenue should be transferred to the county and to the school district only. The city shouldn't get property taxes anymore. And we should move it in a way that it's adjusted. In the short term, uh, Sheriff Milstead actually talked about this in the Minnehaha County meeting when they, when they did the opt out. He's concerned a little bit about the Sioux Falls Police Department and arresting a lot more people than they really need to. And what he was getting at is anytime somebody is arrested, they have to be prosecuted. Well, the city doesn't pay for that. Now, we pay for the police department to arrest these people, but then once they drop them off at the jail, it's the county's responsibility. I think there needs to be some more training and work done with the Sioux Falls Police Department to work on, you know, should we be arresting everybody or should we be working on these things in the field to save the county some money? And, of course, it's going to take state legislation. There's been a lot of talk about, uh, you know, reducing violations and giving ticketing people instead of arresting them for things that they do. Um, and then also I've been hearing stories, I'll leave it on this, uh, Veterans Park, which is a beautiful park. Um, but I've been hearing stories of a lot of vandalism going on there. And I know we've been talking a lot about Heritage Park, but I gotta tell you some of the stories I've been hearing about Veterans Park make Heritage Park look like Disneyland. Uh, vandalism in the bathrooms, fires being set, uh, branches being broken. Um, I hope that we get a handle on this. It's a beautiful park and uh, I hope we do something about it. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Welcome. Bruce Danielson, Sioux Falls. <clears throat> I have a couple little uh, sheets here to put up there. As somebody who's uh, interested in the construction activities of the city of Sioux Falls, I've been waiting for the webcam to work out at the uh, Spellerberg Pool, now known as the Midco Aquatic Center. And this is all we've been getting. And I don't know why, this is just kind of like Sire. I know many of you are having the same problem with Sire. We just can't seem to get anything to work. And so this just adds to another one of those frustrations. We were able to make a webcam work out at the event center when it was being built, and we were able to follow the progress when it was running. And it was running most of the time, but practically every time I wanted to see it. So this was the first one that I've got. And then I wanted to go into another area because uh, uh, a year ago, on July 1st, I stopped up here and I had Scott who was going to help me with a PowerPoint and I had forgotten my PowerPoint at home. And I was going to be talking about the event center siding. And uh, so through a course of events, this administration had me arrested soon afterwards. And the night that I was going to be here putting the... Uh, Talking about the, my PowerPoint, uh, I actually spent six and a half hours 
in the county jail, as <coughs> Scott was just referring to. So uh, I'm here to give my event center discussion on, on how event center siting is supposed to work. What you're seeing right here is we've just done a video this past week showing how much of a mess the event center siding is. We have uh, a lot of things that have been done at the event center that we ended up making this video that's, that's uh, seven minutes and 33 seconds long and it's put to the music of the four seasons because it's been four seasons since we were last up here trying to get something accomplished. And what we've discovered as we've been walking around there is we have little cute little covers covering the holes that we discovered. And so we have these holes as it's kind of hard to see in here, but if you take the cover away, and this is the picture that I put up over a year ago, showing the big hole that I can actually put two fingers into. They took care of that by making these cute little covers, and then they didn't even find a way to glue them into place, any way to stop the water. And so now, when the wind blows, these covers fall out. And if you watch the video, you see I'm pushing a cover back in with my finger. And where you can't see it at direct line, I actually put my uh, camera up and I was able to take a picture up higher than people can normally see and they didn't put any covers in there. So all that water is just pouring thousands of gallons down in these big rainstorms are getting poured down in that building and saturating the inside of the walls. That's a galvanized steel building and it's just gonna be rusting and the dirt is gonna be washing out. And when you watch the video, you'll see the building is getting stained with both rust and dirt because you cannot stop the dirt from trying to find its way back out of that building. So if you, so what we're doing here is you can actually see the dirt and the rust that's starting to develop and you'll see it a lot better on the video. But, and it's up on YouTube so everybody can go see it, but you'll see all over on this building are these effects. And go ahead and, so then we get into the problem that we have that uh, some city officials seem to think is a joke or it's a design feature or they're trying to pass off what they call oil canning. And what that is, is where you're taking a piece of steel. Now, I've been involved in the steel forming world for over 50 years. I grew up in it. And I, in 1965 was the first time I personally ran a shear and press break. So I kind of know what's going on. And I used to sell roll forming equipment. We used to roll thousands of feet of material. So kind of have an idea how to do it. And what we have here are channels. And they are essentially a channel like this. And what that channel is doing is forming a solid piece because of the way it's formed. And every little bend in this thing adds to the strength. But what the oil canning is, is because you can't bend this board. And that's what's happening there, is you can't bend that steel without causing it to crease. And we're re relying on these little tiny screws to hold that steel on the building into very light gauge steel studs. So when that's being bent around the building, it's doing this. And there's no way that building is gonna last the 20 years that, this, that the siding manufacturer wants to warranty the finish. Because when you look close at the finish, Jim, you'll actually see where they've made mistakes and instead of cutting a new piece, they slapped a whole bunch of caulk on it. You can even see where they've chipped it. And that's what that little spot is right below the caulk. And that's what's gonna start the staining and the rusting because you've broken through that protective surface. Go ahead, and thank you. And then you can see here, they've, they've tried to just caulk up something where they've made another mistake. And now we have another gash, multiple gashes we have on a horizontal, if you've got a funnel effect, any water coming sheeting down that building is gonna go dumped right into that building. And that's what we're running into. And then here's, well, we can, yeah, go to the next one. That's hard to see. So then we talked about the Tyvek and the, 
Supposedly, this is our water shield. And Tyvek, as you can see, this I've been going out to the event center all along. There's, you can see the Tyvek. You can see the holes in it. You can see the tears. They didn't tape the seams. They didn't do it correctly. And I've put up a lot of Tyvek in my time and I've never seen such horrible work as what they did here. There's no way that building is gonna stop moisture from going in and, and causing mold in the walls, and we're gonna be continuing with the problem. And I thank you for the time. I'm glad I finally got to give my little speech from a year ago. Uh, sorry for the delay, and thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who wanted to engage the council? Welcome. <laughs> And council, that was uh, seven minutes versus five. I hope you understand. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Well, first of all, I ask that you clear your minds. <laughs> We're going to talk about flowers. My name is Teresa Staley from Sioux Falls. Um, and uh, the first two things I want to talk to you about, I want to invite you all to the Master Garden Tour tomorrow night uh, from 4 to 8. Uh, there'll be four gardens that will be featured. Uh, some of them are in the country, some are in town here. And if you're interested, you can purchase tickets at Lewis Drug uh, in, tonight and, and into tomorrow and come on over and see what different gardeners are doing in our area. Um, my garden will be on the Master Gardener Tour. This will be the third year I've been on the tour. And uh, this ties in with an issue that came up today at the four o'clock and that has to do with the plantings that I have on the boulevard. Um, and in the past when these people have come through, last time I think we had 500 people come through on the tour, they're very interested in what's happening with these flowers on the boulevard, and, and they're, they like them. The history of, of my yard it happened 17 years ago. Um, I, and I've been inspired by the McKinnon Park area, you know, the parkway there where they have Russian sage, day lilies, Asiatic lilies, hostas, it's just beautiful. And those things get rather tall, very well maintained, but very beautiful. Um, when I started to develop that area, I met with Dave Munson, our mayor, several city council members, and Steve Metley, who was then our city planner. And showed, they came by my house, they saw what I was doing, and they gave me their blessing. They said, go ahead. And I've been developing that area ever since. Um, right now, I have about 75% of that boulevard area in flowers. And I know this discussion came up last year, and I, I, it's coming up again. Um, and I just wanted to say, as we're discussing that, uh, gardeners I'm talking with, and we're going to be going out and meeting with other people who have all sorts of things happening in their boulevards. Um, because we think this is important for our city. <laughs> but I have planted things, and other gardeners have as well, that are drought tolerant, use less water. Our Kentucky bluegrass is a big water hog, and it's not environmentally friendly. Um, I have planted perennials in that area that perform beautifully, despite the sand and chemicals that the city dumps on it. I, I don't do anything to them. They just come back every year, uh, which is much different than a lot of people's grasses. And our, our current ordinance, some people may not know this, but if you have grass that has been killed by these chemicals, you are breaking the ordinance. You have to have some living ground cover there. Um, I've also been uh, planting native perennials that attract bees and uh, butterflies. So I'm always working to help the environment. I'm organic, I don't use chemicals, I've been building my soil. I'm trying to keep the rain from going into the storm sewer system. Um, so I think it's all a very positive thing. And what else is very positive is the response and support and encouragement I have had from so many of you last year when this came up and also this year. So God bless you for, for listening and, and being open-minded. And I'm just hoping that as we move forward here that we're going to be encouraging people to be creative um, and to continue to beautify our boulevards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Teresa. Folks, anybody else want to engage the council? Well, very good. Thank you, Ms. Colby. <coughs> Robert Colby, I wish to talk to you a little bit about tonight about future history. When digitizing came on, everybody thought we had gone to heaven. 
because everything could now be taken and we could condense it. It would take up a very small amount of space. It was quick and easy to disseminate the information and you could search a lot of things quickly with things like well, Google and Bing, etc. And you could find information that wasn't available to you without years of research prior to that. It's also been thought that certain uh, governmental records ought to be digitized and then we can store that little digital CD or whatever and we don't have to have hard copy. Two things are coming that I've been made aware of and that you might take to heart. Number one, the Library of Congress has been doing research on CDs and all the other means by which we store the digital information onto a hard copy, a soft copy, whatever you wish to call it, they have been dealing with aging of these particular uh, items, the CDs and DVDs, etc. Now, how do you age something? Heat, cold, moisture, lack of moisture, uh, and all that sort of thing. And they've found that they have taken CDs from a single batch production, brothers or sisters. They've taken them, put information on them, aged them, <coughs> and they found that one will retain the information and another will lose it, and they were from the same batch of material. Another thing that came by more recently that a friend of mine who's very involved in photography that photographers are getting very concerned about is what they call bit rot. We have no way of knowing because we have not had this particular type of information or this type of technology around for 10 years in order to find out whether or not this particular material will maintain itself. Photographers have, are going to the point where when they make their images, they are taking them and making hard copies because bit rot means that bits of information that are stored are degrading and that will cause the loss of your original that you are producing. Now, if it works on photography, which is a high uh, piece of, a large piece of information is stored when you do a, photo a photograph, it's simply giving you indication that what will happen with information that isn't quite as dense. So if you are making any kind of information available to the public digitally, I would recommend, and I think others would recommend, you make at least five different hard copies so that someone can read it in the future for several reasons. Number one, you can always go back to the hard copy. If you can read, you can read that where the digital may degrade. And we know we can store hard copy for a hundred years. We don't know whether or not, if I take this camera and I go and I make a photograph of the individuals here, how long will this last? It's a neat thing because I can do it quickly and easily, but it is not a long-term storage process. Make hard copies, put them in several locations because we are relying on keeping this information and it will be something for the future generations. You don't need to make a thousand copies, but make a goodly number of hard copies to store so that when the archive can be utilized in the future because the formatting here is one thing and the reading of the information off this piece of technology will change in five years or ten years. I can still see a hundred years from now and I can read it, but I may not be able to ever pull the information off of this piece of technology. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Colby. Folks, anybody else want to engage the council? Very good, thank you so much. We'll now move to item number seven. Item number, item number seven is a second reading 
an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the Code of Ordinances of the City by amending Section 41.008 regarding fees for public facility tickets. Good evening, Jim David, Legislative, Legislative Operations Manager for the City Council. For final consideration tonight is a proposed ordinance prompted by an April audit report that identified multiple issues with the public facility ticket fee ordinance. This is the fee that is applied to all city owned sports and entertainment facility tickets that have a fixed seating in excess of 2,500 persons. Specifically, the audit report recommended that the fee structure be simplified or allow operators discretion when working with promoters. Ensure there is no conflicting wording between agreements with operators in the ordinance. Enforce or revise the wording in the ordinance that requires operators to remit fees to the city within 60 days. In response to the audit, the Fiscal Committee approved and moved to the full council several revisions to the existing ordinance. First, this proposal removes the 2,500 person exemption that currently excludes the Pavilion and Orpheum Theater from ordinance. This proposal also clarifies subsection A, which was originally scheduled to expire in December of 2004. Due to confusion with the existing language, the committee approved more clear-cut verbiage, phasing out this provision once the current Sioux Falls Canary season ends this fall. Once subsection A expires, subsection B fees will apply to all season or canary ticket sales. Subsection C was amended to include discretion for facility operators who under this proposal would have the flexibility to negotiate the ticket fee with concert promoters, promoters professional sports teams, and other organizations that sell tickets at the event center or convention center. <clears throat> And finally, subsection D recognizes management agreements and allows them to trump the ordinance. Happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Jim. Folks, this is a second reading. Did anybody want to engage the council on this topic? Welcome. <coughs> uh, Scott Erisman, Sioux Falls. Um, I really believe that this ordinance is very lax and it gives a lot of power to the, the management companies to kind of decide what they're gonna give the city for fees. Uh, we, we own these facilities, the taxpayers of Sioux Falls own the facilities. Uh, we, pay, we pay most of the maintenance on these facilities. We subsidize the operations of these facilities and we pay the mortgages on these facilities. I think we should have a flat fee. I think that we should make these management companies pay this fee on every ticket that they sell. That's how many cities do it. It's not, un, it's not unheard of. Our fee is actually very low, um, and uh, the more money we can bring in, the better. The other reason the fee should be higher is a lot of people who come to events in our, our city are from out of town. So they don't live here, they don't pay property taxes here, they don't pay a lot of sales taxes here. So when they come to our city and use our facilities that we are subsidizing as taxpayers of Sioux Falls, they are helping to pay for the operations of the facility from being from out of town. So I think, I think the, part, the part of the ordinance I don't like is that we're giving the management companies a lot of lax to just kind of do whatever they want to or we'll charge whatever they want to. I think we should make it very clear and just say, this is how much you're gonna pay per ticket, period, and end it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Folks, anybody else? Council? <coughs> Would anybody wanna make a motion, Council? Move to approve. Second, Second Kylie. Councilor Jameson's made a motion to approve uh, this item. Second by Councilor Ruffing. If no discussion, a roll call vote, please. Council members Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? That is passed 8 to 0. Item 8. Item 8 is a second reading. An ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the Code of Ordinances of the City, updating permit and inspection fee exemptions. Mike Cooper, Planning and Building Services. We have an ordinance in place that has been, uh, I think it's been around for quite a few years that identifies certain nonprofit organizations and programs involving affordable housing that are exempt from permanent inspection fees. Uh, those fees would typically be um, required from Planning and Building Services, from Public Works, and from Fire Inspection. This ordinance amendment would add 
the Southeastern Development Foundation to the list of eligible organizations, as well as Community Development Department Neighborhood Revitalization Program projects that would also be exempt from those permit fees. And then we also are adding a fourth uh, city department, which is police. Um, in some cases, police, when they're involved with helping uh, with the moving of a building across town, they charge a fee for that. And when we have students or other um, nonprofits that are building houses that are being moved, uh, this would exempt the police department fees as well. So we're in support of these ordinance amendments. Mike, thank you. Did anybody want to engage the council on this topic? Councilors? Move to approve Anderson. The second, Rolfing. Thank you, councilors, appreciate that. Uh, if there's no discussion, a roll call vote, please. Council members Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach. Yes. That is passed eight to zero. Item nine. Item nine is a resolution vacating the alley right of way from the east right of way line of North Helen Avenue to the west right of way line of North Harlem Avenue, as shown on the attached exhibit. Uh, good evening, Kurt Peppel, City Engineering. Um, this alley <clears throat> right of way is in the kind of northeast, or sorry, northwest part of town. Uh, near Madison Street and just west of Qantas and is not improved. A petition was submitted by Sayre Associates on behalf of the owners. The petitioner has complied with the street vacation policy. If the right-of-way is vacated, utility easement will not be maintained. A uh, neighborhood meeting was not required for this proposed vacation. Uh, engineering supports the right-of-way vacation, and the petitioner was asked to be here tonight. Uh, should there be any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Appreciate that. Folks, anybody want to engage the council on this topic? Councilors? Move to approve Karski. Second, Anderson. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Karski has made a motion to approve this resolution, seconded by Councilor Anderson, Jr. A roll call vote, please. Council members Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? <laughs> yes. Erpenbach? Yes. That has passed 8 to 0. Item 10. Item 10 is a resolution vacating the North Siebert Avenue right of way from the north right of way line of East 57th Street North to the south property line of Lot 9, Block 1, Highland Park subdivision, as shown on Exhibit A. The right of way is on the northeast part of town uh, near the intersection of 60th Street North and Cliff, just a little bit to the east, and is not improved. The petition was prepared by Bender Commercial Real Estate on behalf of the owners. Uh, the petitioner has complied with the street vacation policy. If the right-of-way is vacated, a utility easement will be maintained for public and private utilities on the vacated right-of-way. A neighborhood meeting was held on Thursday, July 2nd, with approximately five, five residents in attendance. Uh, engineering does not have any objections to this right-of-way vacation, and representatives from the petitioner are here to answer any questions. Thank you, Kurt. Did anybody want to engage the council on this resolution? Welcome, sir. My name is Dan Beatty. I own property at 4913 North Subert. Uh, if we vacate the street, I'm wondering what, what happens, uh, snow removal and emergency services to my property. Um, I can't imagine they're gonna back a snowplow up there and push me out. Uh, the street's open to the north. Um, I'm also concerned about the Right away, the former right away being a trail that will encourage uh, drive by dumping, which has certainly been a problem in the past. Um, because that's all I have. And sir, was it Dan? Yes, thank you, Dan. Appreciate that. Kurt, uh, there was a question about um, uh, with this being vacated, what happens with snow removal, for example? I think that was what Dan started with. Thoughts. Uh, I'm not aware if, if snow removal is being done. It is an unimproved uh, gravel section right now. Um, uh, I'm not aware if, if snow removal is being done. There would still be access from the north and 
uh, with the easements and running to the south it should go unchanged until redevelopment takes place which then when when site would develop to the east of their uh, turnarounds would be uh, addressed as part of that site development uh, but for now it would essentially go unchanged and like i said i'm not sure what uh, maintenance is being done right now did anybody else want to engage the council on this or did dan did you have a follow-up question on that you okay very good well sir thank you for being here tonight can i just quickly ask i think it'd be appropriate do you believe the city is is shoveling your snow today you do no he said not on a regular basis but yes it's a okay Sir, uh, Chad Heaty or Kurt, they, they can directly answer your question after the meeting if, if they could just get your contact information. Thank you. Councilors, uh, yes, Councilor Anderson, Jr. Mayor, I guess I'd like to know exactly where his property is on this, on one of these two maps here. Is it north of 57th there? Yeah. Lot 10, oh, up here. Dan, that was lot 10 on the diagram? lot nine which must be to the north of lot 10 yes. okay thank you thank you so there won't be any any change in that area there the, the right of way to the north uh, adjacent to that property will be maintained to 60th street north is that uh unimproved gravel road if i remember right correct yeah. councilor thank you councilor and buck um sir do you live on that property on lot nine it's a contractor shop. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Councilors, yes. for approval. Thank Anderson. you, Councilor Anderson, Jr. I'll second that, Rolfing. Thank you, Councilor Rolfing. If there is no further discussion, a roll call vote, please. Council members Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0. Uh, item 11. Um, Ms. Erickson, did you say yes? Yes. On that? Okay. Sorry, Ms. Sorry. Microphone Thank microphone you. Not working. Okay. Item 11 is a resolution vacating the alley right of way from the north right of way line of West 11th Street to the north lot lines of lots 5A and 14 block 5J L Phillips edition, as shown on Exhibit A. This alley right of way is uh, just east of South Minnesota Avenue north of 11th Street lying between the downtown YMCA and MB. Uh, it is an improved alley. A petition was prepared and submitted by Eric Tucker with the downtown YMCA. The petitioner has complied with the street vacation policy. <coughs> if the right of way is vacated, a utility easement will be maintained for public and private utilities on the vacated right of way. A neighborhood meeting was not required for this right-of-way vacation. Engineering does not object to the um, right-of-way vacation, and I believe there are representatives here if there's any questions. Thank you, Kurt. Did anybody want to engage the council on this topic? Councilors? Move for approval, Anderson. Second, Rolfing. Councilor Anderson Jr. has made a motion to approve this resolution, <laughs> seconded by Councilor Rolfing. A roll call vote, please. Council members Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. That has passed 8 to 0. Item 12. Item 12 is a resolution approving the release of permanent sanitary sewer easements located in Tract 4, Majestic Meadows addition to the City of Sioux Falls and the east one half, northeast one fourth of section 31T101 North. R48W of the 5th PM, Minnehaha County, South Dakota. Uh, this easement is located on the east side of Sioux Falls uh, between South Dakota 100 and Six Mile Road, just south of 41st Street. It was originally established as part of the east side sanitary sewer basin 20 project to uh, future serve the 41st and Faith area of town. <coughs> Uh, all, since then, alternative routes have been established to serve the area, and the sanitary sewer easement is no longer needed. There, there are currently no facilities in that easement. Engineering staff recommends release of the sanitary sewer easement. Thank you, Kurt. 
Did anybody want to engage the council on this resolution? Thank you. Councilors? Councilor Anderson, Jr. What alternative routes? Because that is a really fast-growing area out there. Uh, I know our, our sanitary sewer team uh, looked at it very closely, and, and they were comfortable with the release as it's being sewered elsewhere. Uh, Chad Heavey with engineering. Um, based on the, the timeline and the schedule, um, sewer was, was installed from the south up Faith Avenue to pick that area up. Um, and so this area, um, that area is draining to the south. The rest of it will drain to the east. But um, the existing sewer, uh, the trunks, this was for a trunk sewer line. And it got extended up from the south. Uh, thus, these easements are no longer needed. Thank you. Councilors, would anybody want to make a resolution? Um, so motion? Move, Anderson. Thank you, Councilor. Second Rolfing. Thank you, Councilor Rolfing. Uh, a roll call vote, please. Council members Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0, item 13. Item 13 is a resolution of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, correcting the list of legal descriptions in vacation resolution number 1115. Uh, this this resolution um, corrects legal description list for resolution 1115. The uh, original resolution um, proposed to vacate North North National Avenue near Cliff Cliff Avenue and East Benson Road in, in the northeast part of town. Uh, the the original list included some properties that were not directly adjacent to National, and uh, County Register of Deeds recommended removing those properties. Thanks, Kurt. Did anyone in the audience want to engage the council on this topic? Councilors? Move to approve. Second. Councilor Jameson's made a motion to approve this resolution, seconded by Councilor Anderson Jr. A roll call vote, please. Council members Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? <coughs> Erpenbach? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0, item 14. Item 14 is a resolution of the City of Sioux Falls approving diagonal parking at 435 West 3rd Street between Spring Avenue and Minnesota Avenue. Good evening, Council. Heath Hofteaser, Principal Traffic Engineer with the City of Sioux Falls. Um, item 14, it's a resolution for diagonal parking at the address of 435 West 3rd Street. It's on um, Spring Avenue and on 3rd Street that we're looking at allowing the diagonal parking um, this adds it um, adds about four parking spots total to the area six regular spots that would be included in the diagonal parking and one ADA accessible spot the property is a um, neighborhood apartment if you have any questions about that we have a representative of the building here also tonight and um, one of the interesting things on this is on Spring Avenue we're actually looking at doing the first back-in diagonal parking for the city of Sioux Falls, and a lot of it has to do with there's a pretty good grade on Spring Avenue, and it's a, it allow for a safer situation and allow for some people to experiment with what back-in angle parking actually is. So any questions, be happy to answer them. Thanks, Please. Heath. Appreciate that. Uh, anybody in the audience want to speak to this item? Councilors? Yes, Councilor Staggers. Yes. Who's going to be paying for the diagonal parking? The city or the uh, property owner? Um, the property owner is paying to install it. Okay. Yep. Councilor Jameson. Thank you, uh, Heath. The, uh, would I assume the sidewalk would be just on the other side of that parking? Yes, yes. They'll um, route the sidewalk around the parking area. And as far as snow removal, who would uh, be responsible um, for the park? Generally, in residential areas, it's the property owners that remove the snow out of the diagonal parking spots. So, yes, the property owner would. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm. Councilor, uh, Councilor Anderson, Jr. Um, I was uh, concerned about the uh, landscaping along the alleyway here on this property. Uh, is the owner, is the property owner here, I think I thought you said? Yep, yes, they are. Uh, Wayne Wagner, Housing Development Director for Affordable Housing Solutions, and we're the owner of the property. And uh, actually, um, 
uh, Council, that's the main reason we had to go to the diagonal parking is uh, there's such a dra dramatic um, elevation change from the street there. And um, number one, we, we truly want the building to be ADA accessible. And number two, we have to make it ADA accessible. So pulling the parking up to the uh, north West corner there brings it to the upper elevation, which allows for a gradual slope to the front door. It'll allow us to basically remove the majority of the, the, um, the elevation drop, the drastic drop along the alley. We're actually uh, working with the city street department. They're going to utilize the fill up on North Cliff Avenue, but um, there will be a slope uh, from the east side of the building down to the alley, which will eliminate the issue that's there. And that's, that's what's driving this. And uh, we appreciate the, uh, cooperation uh, that Heath has shown with the city street department. So um, that's that's driving the whole project there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Wayne. You bet. Appreciate that. Move to approve Anderson. Second, Karski. Councilor Anderson Jr. has made a motion to approve this resolution, seconded by Councilor Karski. Good discussion. A roll call vote, please. Council members Jamison. Yes. Karski. Yes. Kylie. Yes. Rolfing. Yes. Staggers. Yes. Anderson. Erickson. Yes. Erpenbach. Yes. That is passed eight to zero. Item 15. Item 15 is a resolution approving the release of the permanent 15-foot drainage easement located in Track 4 I-90 place in addition to the City of Sioux Falls, Minnehaha County, South Dakota. Kurt Peppel, Engineering, once again. Uh, this drainage easement is located in North Sioux Falls near the interchange of I-90 and Cliff Avenue. Uh, the easement was created in uh, 1994. Um, as it currently sits, the easement is not being used for drainage and is not needed based on the existing drainage patterns in the area. Uh, they're currently looking at redeveloping uh, this site and uh, future drainage needs will be um, addressed as part of that site, <clears throat> excuse me, site plan. Uh, engineering recommends uh, release of the drainage easement. Thanks, Kurt. Anybody in the audience want to speak to this topic? Councilors? Councilor Anderson, Jr.? No, this is on the west side of Cliff Avenue, correct? Correct. So where does the city limits end there? Because I didn't think that that housing area was within the city limits because we have a lot of drainage problems up there. Uh, I'm going to raise this again. Okay. Uh, this area is in the city limits. Um, Housing area yes, there too? You, north of there it wouldn't be because if you, um, right north of here is, is the dike that goes around right. Catfish Bay. But this area here is in the city limits. Uh, you're right, there is. We have some major drainage issues up there. I'm Almost every house up there has at least two you're, 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 ta not, you're not talking your drainage, you're talking groundwater, sump pumps. Well, my, uh, I've had several discussions with uh, residents up there, and we um, do have a well we use for um, water production in that area that does keep the groundwater uh, low. And the last person I talked to up there uh, said his sump pump hadn't run for quite some time. Okay. So... Um, I would say it's very flat. It's, it's very challenging up there. I, I, like I said, I've done some driving up in there, and especially oh, when it's driven, wet. Oh yeah, when it's wet up, up there, there, there's a there's a lot of a lot of drainage hoses coming out of homes, and I mean they're not small ones either that are trying to pump out their basements. And I didn't think we had annexed that area in yet, but we have. Okay. Councilor, thank you. Did anybody want to make a motion on this resolution? Move to approve. <coughs> Second, Rolfing. Councilor Karski has made a motion to approve this resolution. Seconded by Councilor Rolfing. A roll call vote, please. Council members Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. That has passed 8 to 0. Item 16. Item 16 is a resolution of the City of Sioux Falls approving diagonal parking on Phillips Avenue. Keith Hoftieser, Principal Traffic Engineer for the City of Sioux Falls. This is a resolution to approve diagonal parking on the west side of Phillips Avenue between 5th Street and 6th Street. We um, 
have been looking at this area of Phillips Avenue and then we got a request from some of the adjacent property owners to look at incorporating more parking if possible onto the street and we've looked at we're able to add diagonal parking at this location um, and still leave in place the left turn at 5th Street and down at 6th Street and um, the area on Phillips Avenue in between 5th Street and 6th Street has a big gourd out area that um, is really just unused pavement that we'll be able to restripe the road basically and um, initially add about 10 to 12 spots and then with future redevelopment and changes on the west side it may be able to expand up to 18 added spots from the from the change um, one of the things that we're doing is working with public parking to look at if if they're going to keep the meters there that we'll be phasing in the improvements with public parking to get the meters incorporated and in anything else we need to do so thank you Heath. anybody in the audience want to speak to this item welcome I think Heath just said it, but the question I have is, they are going to meter? Those spots will be metered? Um, the intention right now is that we'll most likely be metering the spots. Okay, because I'm all for it, but I do believe that we should meter them because I know, well, Phillips Avenue is metered all the way down anyway, and then if you go over to Main Avenue, it's metered all the way down to the old brewery parking lot or wherever that building is now. So I'm hoping that we meter all those spots because that's, a lot of extra spots so let's put more meters up thank you <laughs> counselors move approval rolfing second jameson Councilor rolfing's made a motion to approve this item second by Councilor jameson a roll call vote please council members jameson yes karski yes kylie yes rolfing yes staggers yes anderson yes erickson yes erpenbach yes that is passed eight to zero item 17. item 17 is a resolution authorizing use of construction manager at risk services for the construction of a city administrative office building along with landscaping a parking lot and potential skywalk Chad Heavey representing the Office of Public Works. Uh, similar to what we've done on other past building projects, uh, we are recommending we use the construction manager at risk delivery method uh, to construct the proposed administrative offices uh, north of the parking ramp on city property uh, at 8th and Dakota. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Did anybody in the audience want to speak <coughs> to this item? Oh, yeah, Mr. Danson, welcome. Bruce Danielson, I was uh, sent a message to all the city council members this past uh, weekend uh, expressing some concerns about authorizing anything in this process. We have a problem here that we've never received a single audit on any of the projects so far being done manager at risk. We're talking about the event center, we've had something called a pre-audit, something or other that told us the construction methods or the bookkeeping methods, but you know, we were still waiting for information on who the contractors were. We don't know what was spent on the event center. We know that we've had a, a mess when it came to the construction, and apparently we may not even be able to come back and actually have a real discussion about getting the event center fixed. And so now we're gonna, now we're involved in an indoor pool, and the indoor pool, we're manager at risk again, uh, where they say we can build something for $24 million, and, but we're not gonna guarantee what's there. We'll give you a year to find any problems, and then we're out of here. Well, that's what we're up against with the event center right now, and it's really becoming quite an issue and a concern to a lot of the citizens in this town that now we don't even know if we're gonna build an administration building, and now you're already beginning the process that steamrolls it to conclusion by having a manager at risk again. And I would request that at this situation, you take a little bit of time, you think through the process, make sure you get some audits done on the event center and find out where the problems came apart on that building, who authorized the siding, who authorized the lousy concrete job inside the building. You know, who authorized just the only waterproofing, windproofing that's on the building is Tyvek that's torn. 
you know, these are issues that are really important for a $117 million building, and now you're talking about building another $4 million building, and we don't even know the mess that we've got to clean up. So I just ask that you think about this, postpone it until you actually have some real information to work with. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Denson. Folks, anybody else want to engage the council? Very good. Councilors? Councilor Steggers? <coughs> yes, I have a question for Chad. Chad? Mr. Danielson used the figure $4 million as the cost of the building. That's the first time I've heard a cost. Is that correct or not? Um, I'm not aware of what the estimated cost is. Because that's the, the primary concern I have before I vote for this. Uh, I don't even know the cost of the building. I don't know how big it is. I don't know whether we really need it because, you know, um, no we're supposed to... Um, have determined the scale and scope of the building before we do this and examine local government space needs and then select the architect and construction manager. We, I hardly know anything about this building. We are in the process of, uh, we we've, we've, are in the process of selecting an architect. That RFP has been issued uh, and they are being reviewed. Um, once they're hired, which will, will come to you for your approval, um, the next step would be then to issue the RFP for the construction manager at risk. And then we still, as of now, do not know the co an estimated cost. I don't expect anything to be precise, but an estimated cost we don't have in front of us. And also there's the statement here that the benefit of the recommended solution owning will cost less than leasing. How do we know that? We have no numbers, no nothing. I think what we ought to do is delay this until we get some numbers. Councilor Kursky. Kind of along the same line, Chad, the construction manager at risk bears the risk if the price escalates above what was originally bid. Exactly. And that, that risk comes with a premium. Typically, what is that premium? Is it a percent, one percent of the um, building, or can you? Can well, I, I think it's going to vary on, of course, the size of the, the contract. Now, you know, the event center was um, well over 100 million. This will be much less than that. The aquatic center is somewhere, well, it's much lower than the event center as well. Um, but I think um, you know these types of buildings uh, are much different than when we construct uh, a road project. Um, most of that, you know, is um, very cut and dry, and, and the timelines are very detailed. Um, I think the advantage here is that you're going to be having this construction manager at risk partnering with us um, through the entire process, and we can better manage the scope uh, and the budget. Councilor Karski. You know, a lot of times government entities get, get into trouble because, or get a bad rap because they authorize the construction of a project and, and it escalates and they keep throwing more money at it and throwing more money at it and throwing more money at it. This is a great way to eliminate that problem. So I, I fully support the concept of a construction manager at risk. I know it's a contract that, that will have to come back to us for approval. So right now we're just authorizing the use of one pending a contract coming to us for approval. We typically use the design, bid, build, construction delivery method with everything we normally do. Uh, when we want to do a different delivery method when it's appropriate, such as design, build, or CM at risk, we have to get uh, your authorization to use that <laughs> method. So you are correct. All we are doing today is getting your approval uh, to use that method, but still you will be voting on uh, the contract with the architect and also the contract for who is selected for the CM at risk. Councilor Buck. Thank you. I, I need a historical perspective. I feel like I've missed a bunch of meetings and I've missed very few meetings. And I'm thinking, did I miss the vote where we approved this building? What? What, what are we doing? 
We don't know how much it's going to cost. We don't know that the council even supports it, but now we're hiring a construction manager at risk. And mm -hmm. I agree with Councillor Karski. It's a great plan. I love construction manager at risk because we can say, here's how much you're spending. Don't go over it. You go over it. You eat it, right? Love that. Really not comfortable with it with moving forward on this project and we don't know numbers we haven't said as a council again the appropriating body hasn't said we're going to build a building i'm really i'm voting no on this for now i'd love to see it later on when it's got some meat to it but i'm going to vote no at this point councilor Kelly, uh, i would just like to say state that uh as chad has mentioned um, the rfp for the architect and engineer has gone out we'll start reviewing those proposals and then a selection will take soon take place soon after that and so until we actually have an architect and engineer hired it is pretty difficult to put a price tag on the cost of a building until we get the, the get their answers so i think you're asking for information before it's actually available we, we we're kind of putting the cart before the horse here a little bit yes counselor i uh... It seems to me what we're doing is authorizing you to use that method, not to hire somebody, not to put an RFP out on it, not to do anything like that. We're authorizing the use of that method of construction only tonight. Am I correct? You are correct. Okay. I think everyone is getting a cart before the horse thinking we're, we're building the building, we're uh, doing uh, a construction manager or hiring one, and we're just going to move forward and plow through on this. No. All we're doing today is saying this is the method we want to use if and when we build that building. And correct? when we, you are correct. And when we um, were looking at the city, city hall renovations, uh, we did have TSP do some um, very, very preliminary work on, on a size and a little bit on location. Right. Um, and so to date, we have not hired anybody. Um, but you're correct, we will uh, bring a recommendation to hire the architect back to you, uh, and then more of the details will, will be evaluated and brought forward. Councilor Kai. And I just wish to, to clarify, my, clarify my cart before the horse comment, and that is that I meant we're requesting the request for the amount of the building, the cost of the building, we're, we're kind of putting the cost before the, uh, the cart before the horse here so uh, I think it is a reasonable procedure that uh, is suggested and I would urge approval thank you Councilor Erickson just a side side conversation kind of related obviously to this but where are we on timeline for the building can you give me what comes next what are we what are we doing we have dollars uh, and 15 dollars and 16 that would finalize um, I'd say the construction process and then um, work would follow after that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Jameson, did you have a comment before I go to Councilor Stegers? Uh, go ahead, go to Carmen. Uh, Councilor Stegers. You said we have money already. What is the money? Uh, yes. I believe it's in facilities management's uh, budget. Because we're talking about we can't come up with a number or whatever. Well, just a few hours ago, we were talking about, you know, the uh, inter the uh, exchange on 85th. Now, they don't have precise figures, but they told us around 25 million. And here we're talking about this building. We still don't have any numbers. Was there a question there? <laughs> yeah. Can we have numbers first before we vote on this? Councilor Stegers, thank you. You, mm -hmm. you, you, you've no reiterated that point twice. Thank you. You've done a great job. Did anybody want to make huh? this point. Did anybody want to make a, uh, a motion on this item? We've had good discussion. Move for approval, Kylie. And I'll second it, Rolfing. Then a motion by Councilor Kylie, seconded by Councilor Rolfing. Yes, Councilor Jameson. Yeah, the problem I'm having with this is the context in which it's being discussed is uh, almost as though it's a foregone conclusion. Even though you're doing prep work, and I get that. Um, I don't like the context that it's put in as well uh, in assuming that perhaps it will happen because I think there's several big hurdles before we go and build another building that we need to overcome. 
uh, so I can't support this either. I don't think we're losing a lot of time or miss preparing for the future by not doing this resolution tonight. Uh, I don't appreciate the context in which it's actually written. Thank, Thank you. A roll call vote, please. Council members Jameson? No. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? No. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? No. Erpenbach? No. Yes, that passes 5 4. Item 17, or item 18, sorry. Okay, um, item 18 is to set a hearing date for Tuesday, August 11th, 2015, at 7 o'clock p.m. A proposed resolution vacating the South Hillview Road right away from the South Right Away line of East 22nd Street to the South Property Lines of Lot 1, Block 9, and Lot 9, Block 8, Sunny View East Edition to the City of Sioux Falls, as shown on Exhibit A. Good evening, Kirk Peppel, City Engineering. Uh, this <coughs> right away is located on the east side of Sioux Falls, just south of East 22nd Street, and uh, a little west of South Dakota 100. And it, as it said, is it is currently improved. Uh, petition was prepared and submitted by Doug Allen with Allen Homes. The petitioner has complied with the, the street vacation policy and will be notified to be at the formal hearing date to answer any questions. If the right of way is vacated, a utility easement will be maintained for public and private utility utilities on the vacated right of way. A neighborhood meeting is not required for this proposed vacation. Engineering does not have any objections to vacating this right away. Thank you, Kurt. Would anybody want to set a hearing date for Tuesday, August 11th for this item? So moved. Second. Councilor Jameson's uh, set that hearing date motion. Second by Councilor Karski. Uh, yes, Councilor Kiley. Or Councilor Rolfing, my apologies, sir. Boy. Councilor Rolfing? I know we got the same haircut. <laughs> you look great. Yeah. You look great. <laughs> um, Kurt, on this one, how are we going to get, um, when that, that piece of property to the south of that vacated area right there that we're looking at, when that gets in, how are we going to get people in and out? Wouldn't that be an obvious way for us to uh, uh, allow people to travel down Hillsview uh, to get out of that area as it's developed? Or are we going to landlock ourselves like we've done before at times and not not have enough ways out of a out of a place. Uh, I know the um, principal street engineer and traffic have reviewed this, um, and, and I'm not aware of any concerns due to the redevelopment plan to the south. I don't know. Well, if I he, am. Heath has any. I don't see any. I don't see any other streets <coughs> other than that one going to the north. Well, maybe Counselor, that is. They'll one. have uh, Cynthia is is east of there i mean is the west the intersection of 22nd and cynthia you can't see does that come south there at an that angle comes south uh, 22nd street also continues to the to the east and it'll also have connection to red oak drive to what uh, red oak street that goes around rosa park school okay is red oak drive nothing on oh, the the trailer park uh there nope there won't be any connection there no connection there see that's so they'll have three ways in and out. So what happens to this property then? It, um, it reverts to the each neighbor and they take care of half of it? Is that it or typically what? Typically it's divided uh, by the county. So you know, typically it would go back to where it came from. So you would assume that each property donated 30 feet of right of way uh, when it was platted. Mm. So half will go east, half will go west. Mm. We're throwing away. You're saying, Chad, that 22nd goes all the way to Sycamore? Does not... I'm saying 22nd will go into this area. Well, not south, it won't. 22nd goes, runs east and west. Right. And it comes out. There's a there's, there's right of way uh, up to 20... All the way through that to where the, I'll say, the agricultural field is. Right. <coughs> So, yeah, there, go back one. So 
So are we? Yeah, but I don't know that we agree that that's that that we should um, vacate that at this time. When we look at development there, I think we're going to wish that we had another another place to get people in and out. But we're going to have Red Oak Drive and then Cynthia. I, I understand, but that's a how how many acres is that? Is that area? This is there? a small. Um, the first. The first issue that Doug Allen wants to build is a relatively, I think it takes maybe the northern third of that property. Yeah, but I'm talking about the whole thing here because we got to get people in and out. And if we get don't get don't get a way to do that, another way to do that, I could see it ending up with uh, a way to the north and a way to the south, and there's going to be way more than 30 homes on that piece of property, which means we gotta we gotta have some good in and out out there. Am I correct or not? You are correct, but it's been reviewed and. Uh, by the fire department and by us, um, and we feel that's adequate. Okay. Councilor uh, Karski. So, Mr. Allen is requesting the vacation, but he has no interest in that on either side or no. of that property. Is that correct? He just wants it vacated. So, for what purpose or intent? It's my understanding the neighborhood wants it vacated so that that traffic from that development doesn't go north. So he's, he initiated the petition with those two property owners. They, they're the ones that had to sign off on it. Okay, and that, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, they because now they have to take care of it, basically, and there's gonna be a permanent easement on there. They can't put a structure on it. They have lawn to mow, and that's about it, correct? Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Anderson, Jr. Yeah, I wish we had a larger photo of this area because I still would want to see to the north of that. I want to see what exits out into Sycamore because we're talking a great number of homes over here that just sort of spiral into each other. And how many exits do we actually have? I, 22nd looks like it goes to a certain point and then goes north to whatever that road is there. It's not 18th that connects to Sycamore. Am I correct there? Because I don't 20 see 22nd goes second north, going. 22nd just, goes north. Uh, I'll just assume it's 20th and goes to Sycamore. Uh, Cynthia also goes north and connects into 20th and heads over to Sycamore. Um, and in addition, there'll be um, several other internal roads um, built in this area to get people either to Red Oak Drive or to 18th Street. We'll, which will evidently or ultimately take them out to uh, Veterans Parkway. Veterans Parkway. Councilor, just a reminder, this is a, we're, what we're trying to do is set a, potentially setting a hearing date. So you're not approving this or disapproving this tonight. Obviously, the, you have some questions and the public Obvious. works team will certainly work with you to address those prior to the August 11th proposed date if, if, if somebody would want to make a motion. I'll make the motion. Councilor Anderson, Jr., I would thank second you. That I thank you. Councilor Buck. Then my question then is, because we are you're setting a hearing and there's a neighborhood being required, is that correct for this? Will the neighborhood have to have a, a meeting between now and then? We typically don't require a neighborhood meeting if it's, not, if it's not a street that's traveled by the public. Okay. Um, I, I realize we're setting the hearing tonight, but I, I think we need to, this neighborhood needs to understand that they don't have support for this from council that until this development below on the south there develops more because we're the ones that take the heat for it publicly we've done it more and more this year we're the ones that take the heat when there aren't enough places ways to get out of a development and i think i think that's what you're hearing from us is that we're not excited about cutting off our options before we see what that next development is we may do it then but we will bring you additional information that'll be great in august thanks Good discussion. A roll call vote, please. Council members Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0. Item 19. Item 19 is a proposed, res uh, I'm sorry, to set a hearing date for Tuesday, August 11th, 2015 at 7 o'clock p.m. A proposed resolution vacating the North Summit Avenue right away from the South right of way line of West Russell Street to the North right of way line of West Bennett Street. This right-of-way is located in uh, northern Sioux Falls, 
uh, west of North Minnesota Avenue and just south of West uh, Russell Street and is currently improved. A petition was prepared and submitted by Dabbert Properties. They have complied with the street vacation policy and will be notified to be at the formal hearing to answer any questions. If the right-of-way is vacated, a utility easement will be maintained for public and private utilities on the vacated right-of-way. A neighbor neighborhood meeting was held uh, Thursday, June 25th with approximately three to five residents in attendance. Engineering does not object to the right-of-way vacation. Thanks, Kurt. Councilors, would anybody want to set a hearing date for Tuesday, August 11th for this item? So moved. moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, who was that? Councilor Anderson Jr. Thank and you. Councilor Karski. Thank you. A roll call vote, please. Council members Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0. Item 20. Item 20 is to set a hearing date for Tuesday, August 11th, 2015 at 7 o'clock p.m. A proposed resolution vacating the South Duluth Avenue right away from the South right of way line of West 39th Street to the North right of way line of West 41st Street. Uh, this right of way is located uh, just west of the intersection of South Minnesota Avenue and West 41st Street and is currently improved. Uh, petition was prepared and submitted by Sayer Associates on the behalf of the adjacent property owner. They have complied with the street vacation policy and will be notified to be at the formal hearing to answer any questions. If the right of way is vacated, uh, a utility easement will be maintained for public and private utilities on the vacated right of way. A neighbor neighborhood meeting was held Wednesday, June 3rd with approximately 12 to 15 residents in attendance. And engineering does not object to the right of way vacation. Thanks, Kurt. Hey, Councilor Buck. Two questions. One, I, I've wanted to ask this all night, Kurt. Sometimes you say engineering does not object to this, and sometimes you say engineering encourages or supports it. Yeah. Is there a difference? Um, I did uh, indicate that we supported the vacation on the alley um, right. near North Madison Street. This one, you just don't object to it. You know, uh, the reason I, the that we supported that one is because there is um, the city is looking at purchasing some of that um, um, property for a, a electrical substation. So we are in favor of that one to okay. go through. Okay. The other so ones we just uh, are not objecting. You're to. just not saying no. Okay. <laughs> so then my question about this is we've seen this before this summer and I want to know what, what's the difference? What's changed? So um, we already voted this down once. Uh, essentially, uh, I guess Chad and Mike have any comments. It is the same. I'll, I'll comment, Dennis. Um, they're going to come back. We were, are working with them on um, some parking questions on Norton. Uh, and we're going to try to, they are going to attempt to address your questions regarding uh, parking, employee parking, and some of the other issues that would, were brought up. To go back to your first question, um, from a transportation uh, network, this um, we don't see an issue with vacating this right away, but um, I would use the word we don't object because I don't want anybody to think that I'm in support of whatever the property owners want to do. So um, when we say we don't object, we um, means we're okay with it, but I don't want you know the, everybody to think that. Um, that we're behind this, we're in support of it, we're, we're you know, rallying for it. So, If I might then, Mr. Mayor, so what you're saying is when you say or Kirk says uh, city engineering supports it, then the city has an interest in it and really does want it to happen. Because there have been times tonight when he has said city engineering supports this. Um, I'm not, I don't want to die. I'm just saying this is really interesting to me. This whole conversation has been sometimes <laughs> they don't object and sometimes they support it. And that is interesting to me. I just, I think maybe a couple other people might wonder that too. That's, that's all I'm saying. It's interesting that you find that interesting. Right? So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway I, I, to go back to this though, what you're saying to us is that it is not a different proposal than what was originally planned. Do we have a traffic study on what happens to Norton 
if Duluth gets vacated? Do we have that yet? Has that been done? We will have uh, those numbers. any traffic related numbers you need. Um, we're working with them on an access for their parking lot onto Norton Avenue, where that could be located, and then also parking on Norton Avenue for billion. Parking on Norton for billion, okay. Right now, billion would be the property owner on the, the east side of Norton Avenue. They are currently the property owners. If they want to remove parking, they could come to us and say that. Um, I would I would caution that because uh, when you take parking off, um, speeds are going to increase, and the residents on the west side may want that parking there for their for their own use. And so I think that's what brings this. Uh, when they come back in August, they have to they're going to talk more about. Um, what they plan on to do with their employees uh, and their parking and, and how that all plays into what they plan on to doing. Okay, then one more brief question, Mr. Mayor. Would there be then another uh, neighborhood meeting prior to this, um, to the public hearing, when, or when we have our... We final? can certainly have one more. Uh, I just think it might be prudent, um, given the history in this neighborhood, the conversations that we've had certainly. with them. Oh, thank you. Councilor Jameson. Uh, thank you. Was there a, I think, did I hear right, there's another neighborhood meeting planned? No. Not we yet. will have another one. <laughs> <laughs> was... Councilor Jameson, uh, Councilor Urbanbach asked if there was going to be another meeting. Councilor, or uh, Mr. Heavey said, well, not yet, but we can certainly have one. And so it gave the indication that he's going to set it up. So that's where we're at right here. I thought I saw one was scheduled. They have one already. You already had one. We already had one. But I thought there was another one. We had one, one before the initial, um, but we will schedule uh, one uh, before we have the public hearing in August. Folks, would anybody want to set a hearing date for Tuesday, August 11th for this item? So moved. Second. Councilor Kiley set that hearing date motion, and Councilor Karski was kind enough to second it. A Rokovo, please. Council members Jameson. Yes. Karski. Yes. Kylie. Yes. Rolfing. Yes. Staggers. Yes. Anderson. Yes. Erickson. Yes. Erpenbach. Yes. That is passed. Eight to zero. Item twenty one. Item twenty one is a reconsideration from the July seventh, twenty fifteen City Council meeting, second reading. An ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the code of ordinances of said city by changing a street name. Councilor Jameson. I'd like to make a motion to reconsider. I will. I will. That motion has died for lack of a second. A second, yeah. I, I, didn't, I was waiting to ask for a second. Uh, David? Very good. Uh, Councilor Jameson's made a motion to reconsider. Uh, we are going to allow the second. Mm -hmm. uh, by Councillor Staggers, uh, Councillor Jamison. Thank you. I'd like to at least acknowledge that I uh, appreciate this reconsideration by the council. I take it as a personal privilege, and I really appreciate it. I need you to know that. Uh, I brought this back in, uh, in front of you because I, frankly, feel like I've made a mistake when I voted for it last time. I thought, you know, how can you vote against veterans? <clears throat> and uh, so I wanted to feel good, and I did. But afterwards, I kind of came to realize that what we were doing was putting, our, putting a sign essentially on a road out on the edge of town without any historical or relevance to the veterans in our community. And there are other great places that we could celebrate their service. And I failed. And I, just, I just wanted a chance to come back and correct my vote you know, ever since this kind of got back on the schedule, I've been inundated with calls of people with plenty of ideas about where they could maybe do this Veterans Parkway. And uh, they've got all kinds of ideas. And I didn't have a solution. I didn't, I didn't uh, want to vote no for naming Highway 100 and Powderhouse Road Veterans um, Parkway. I didn't have a, another alternative plan I just know that there's a better place. <coughs> and I intended to change my vote so that I could uh, 
maybe allow a discussion to occur perhaps with those veterans groups and they could come to the table and, and start talking about what's important to them, what history is important to them, and why is it relevant. And we could then work with them, find a location that they could celebrate and own. And uh, again, tonight I ask for your reconsideration. Councilor, thank you. Any others? Councilor uh, Ruffing? I want to um, turn on my microphone first. I want to thank you uh, for making, uh, Councilor Jamerson, for making me uh, uh, come to the council with some additional information. I think we've had some, um, some misinformation that has gone into uh, a lot of this, uh, not only by the media, but also a lot of people not understanding exactly what's happening. So I, I want to try and make it clear and I appreciate um, uh, Jim David putting together a um, uh, PowerPoint for us. Jim, would you move over to that PowerPoint that we put together first, please? And um, Mr. Chair, I, I, yeah, I have a point of order. I guess I probably should have brought this up earlier, but aren't we discussing the motion to reconsider itself? And then if that uh, passes, then we can go into the debate over um, whether to. Uh, Councilor Steger, is a Jameson motion made a. Councilor Jameson made a motion to reconsider the item that was discussed mm -hmm. last week. Uh, uh, you then seconded that, so that's why we're having the discussion now. I started with Councilor Jameson, who gave his uh, discussion, and now Councilor. Uh, Rolfing is asking to do the same thing, and that's what he's doing right now. Yeah, I understand, but shouldn't we have maybe been talking about the motion to reconsider itself? That, that, is, what then, we're, that is what we're doing, sir. Uh, Councilor, J Councilor Jameson relayed to the public yeah. what he felt were valid reasons for the reconsideration, and now Councilor uh, Rolfing is going to do the same um, but probably in, in a different light. Are we going to allow the citizens to... Uh, right now, we're still trying to figure out whether there's going to be a motion to reconsider, sir. Okay? Yes, so that's what we're doing now. Yes, but are we going now. to allow... Councilor um, Staggers, we're still... Right now, we're trying to... We're trying to figure out, sir, whether there's going to be a motion to... Whether there, the motion to reconsider that was recommended by Councilor Jameson, seconded by you, we're going to figure out whether that's going to pass or fail first, sir. That's how it works. Okay. Yeah, but so, once again, are we going? Councilor Staggers, I, I apologize, sir. I'm moderating the meeting. Councilor, you, I you interrupted. I do order in, here that the citizens should have an opportunity to also say something too. Councilor Staggers, right now we're still in the process to decide whether this is going to be reconsidered or not, sir. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Rolfing. Continue, please. Okay, I just wanted to uh, continue on with this. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, if you look at the uh, map that is in, many of the, most of the misinformation that's been around is about uh, the change of uh, name of Powderhouse Road. It would go away, it would disappear. That is, that is not the fact. The yellow and red show where the <coughs> proposed uh, Veteran Parkway, uh, proposed Veteran Parkway goes, the yellow and the red or orange colors. As the street progresses to the north and south, it will be called Veterans Parkway. Um, if you look at the intersection uh, of Arrowhead Parkway that illustrates Powderhouse Road to the north and Highway 11 to the south, you will see that nor uh, Powderhouse Road goes to the north. If you're looking, this is looking east on, on um, uh, Powderhouse or on uh, Arrowhead Parkway. Powderhouse Road does continue there, uh, although that would be taken out. Powderhouse Road would continue north of there, but south. It uh, clearly states that it is Highway 11. The intersection at Arrowhead Parking looking northeast on Potter House Road is designated for the north section of the highway. And again, then the intersection at Arrowhead Parkway looking east, Highway 11 is designated on the south. It is not, Highway 11 is not Potter House Road. Um, the Darley, Dowley Farm ent entrance on 18th Street looks uh, east on Highway 11, again, with only that a street sign on it, just Highway 11. The street uh, past this intersection, as you can see where that stop sign is, is currently sound, signed as Powder House Road. This will not change. This will not change under this proposed ordinance. 
Um, the picture is the next picture illustrates uh, the current Powder House Road street signage inside Split Rock, just east of Dowley Farm. And then intersection at 26th Street looking northeast, Highway 11 again is the only sign that is there. No street name listed uh, at 33rd, 41st, 57th intersection. It's all Highway 100. From the standpoint of the, um, of the historical sign, um, let's move to the, uh, to, well I can, let's, no let's stay on this one Jim, I'm sorry, as long as we're here. Um, do we want to have a powder house road extending from Interstate 90 to Interstate 29? I think we do. Uh, would it not make a lot more historical sense to have powder house site recognized at the actual site where the Century Theater uh, at Dolly Farm is? Does a, does a powder house road uh, intersection at Western and South Louise make a lot of sense? No, I think that Veterans Parkway is uh, wrapping around the city that pays tribute to both veterans past, future, and present makes a lot more sense. If we look at this last map here, you'll see how Veterans Parkway, or Highway 100, I will say, um, is, is uh, projected to be going all the way from Interstate 90 to Interstate 29, and eventually going up the Ellis Road backed up to uh, Interstate 90 again. It would be a loop around the entire city that would be very, um, a very responsible way to honor our vets uh, in this way. So if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. Councilor, thank you. Councilors, did anybody have any more discussion on the reconsideration? Councilor Steger, sir. I guess I'll go ahead and uh, uh, give another point of view. Um, I'm an Air Force veteran and I'm a professor of history. So I'd like to have my cake and eat it too. And I think we can do that by focusing on, first of all, the historical Powder House uh, Road, of course, um, deals with a very historical event that took place. And um, many people feel that that should be recognized even more than it is. And then, of course, with the veterans, definitely we want to recognize the veterans. But some people might say, hey, let's have the Veterans Parkway from 60th Street North going down present Minnesota, past the, the airport, and of course, eliminating Minnesota Avenue in front of the airport, and then continuing the Veterans Parkway on Russell to the interstate. So we would kind of have the airport kind of surrounded uh, by Veterans Parkway, and very historic, of course, because the old air base there and also, we would have a situation where we would be close to the Veterans uh, Park itself. So that fits perfectly. But there's always been one thing that I've always been concerned about. If I fly into Sioux Falls, get off the airplane, go through the terminal, get in a car, and then I'm on Minnesota Highway or Minnesota Avenue. Hey, we're in South Dakota. We're in Sioux <laughs> Falls. I, I would prefer not having that area, that part by the airport called Minnesota Avenue. And also at the same time, for people that are new to Sioux Falls, they would see that it's Veterans Parkway. And that would demonstrate, of course, the high regard we have for veterans here in, in Sioux Falls. So I think really doing something like this or something similar would be the best thing to do. But in the process of thinking about this and, and finding out how this all happened, we have the street um, uh, committee uh, of the city making the decision. And who are the members of this committee? Well, Chad, you're the, the chair of the committee. And it's a committee consisting of just city employees. There's no citizens involved. There were no veterans, as far as I know, on the committee. So what we have to do, maybe, is to think about getting more citizen input. And I think this is where this whole process has kind of failed. We have not had enough citizen input, except for, you know, last Tuesday when we voted on this, we had the historical people doing a fine job of testifying. But it was just a matter of minutes before we actually voted on this. So I would hope that um, we would uh, do the reconsideration and think about another way 
to honor the veterans, even a better way than what is proposed in uh, this uh, measure that we voted on last Tuesday. Councilor Sayers, thank you. Councilor Karski. Yeah, thank you. First of all, I want to thank Councilor Rolfing. Um, bringing this to the council didn't happen overnight. It took a lot of work, talked to a lot of people, and we always we, we keep hearing, let's put it in a better place. You know, we talk about doing a better place, a better street, to, you know, renaming something, but who's going to do that work? Who's going to contact those hundreds or thousands of people? Who's going to take the time to um, put, it, put forth that effort and bring it to the council? Thank you, Councillor Rolfing, for doing this. I appreciate it. I'm also a veteran. I'm six years active duty in the Air Force, honorably discharged. I fully support the renaming of this street. It's a brand new highway. And, and actually, we're not renaming anything. We're naming the highway. The street name is still there. I'm honored as a veteran, and I see absolutely no reason why this should not be renamed or named Veterans Parkway. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Kelly. And another point to make, too, in addition to the fact that uh, Powder House Road will continue to exist, Highway 11 is what is being renamed. Uh, there's been some discussion about the actual Powder House location doing a better job of uh, honoring <coughs> that location and putting signage up. And uh, I, I know that speaking with uh, the developer of the Dolly Farm area, they are in agreement that they are willing to work with the city and Mike Cooper could probably address that better than I but there is a greenway area throughout that development uh, that will see further development and will have opportunities there in terms of signage and historical markers uh, yes Councilor Anderson jr. Yes, uh, last week when we voted on this, a lot of the discussion started about the placement of the historical plaques. Uh, if those historical plaques were placed along Highway 100, which, or if you want to call it uh, uh, whatever you want to call it, no matter what, there's not going to be any stopping there. There is no, it, it's a highway. There will be no stopping to read those plaques. I felt that the, with the with Councilman Rolfing's ideal, and by placing those plaques the, on the northwest corner of that Dolly Farm Theater, you would have a destination to go to where the actual location was very close by, and then you could actually enhance the story. Um, I'm still a little bewildered because the story basically is nothing but criminal activity by very unsuccessful criminals. Uh, but, uh, you know, you never know what uh, we, we want to hold on to. The names of the streets are still going to be there. Uh, there will be an enhancement area where we will actually can put the plaques where people can stop and read the story. Um, I, I think this is something that uh, we should just support. And also, just to step in there, too, I'm also a Marine veteran, four years, uh, honorably discharged. Counselors, for all those of you who served, uh, we thank you for your service. There's been good discussion. Let's have a vote on the motion to reconsider. Point of order. Are we going to allow the citizens to say something now about this? we got to get past Ms. Ms. Staggers, we're, uh, as Counselor Jamison knows, thank you, Counselor Jamison. I appreciate that. What we're doing, sir, and again, I stated this a couple times, but I'll do it one more time. Uh, Councilor Jamison wanted the council to potentially reconsider the vote that happened last week. Okay, uh, you were late in the second, but we did allow it. You didn't ask okay? for a second, but and uh, so we have allowed the discussion. Councilor Jamison started it. Councilor Rolfing uh, also gave his testimony along with a number of other councilors. So at this point in time, sir, as a council, you're trying to figure out whether you want to reconsider this again. And so that's what we're voting on right now, folks. And uh, we've had good discussion. So um, let's have a vote. We will vote on the motion to reconsider. Uh, thank you. Council members Jamison? Yes. Karski? No. Kylie? No. Rolfing? No. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? No. Erickson? No. 
Erpenbach. No. That motion to reconsider has failed two to six. Um, Council, is there any, are there any other items you'd like to discuss tonight? Motion to adjourn. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Councilor. Yeah, uh, if there's no further discussion, uh, who would like to adjourn? Say aye. 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 Opposed? This meeting has adjourned. Make it a great night, Sioux Falls. Thank you so much for your service, City Council.